to the story that's dominated the week. Why do some young British Muslims start to hate the country they live in? And what will stop them joining fanatics and turning to violence? When the American journalist James Foley was beheaded by Islamic State militants, the video of his death showed a masked man who appeared to have a London accent. While the authorities try to trace him, the government is also talking of tougher measures to crack down on anyone who might be peddling so-called hate speech. But how big is that threat and what can be done to try to stop it? James Foley's death shocked the world, not only with its barbarity, but also because his killer is thought to be British. The news prompted the Prime Minister to return early from his holiday. What we must do is redouble all our efforts to stop people going, to take away the passports of those contemplating travel, to arrest and prosecute those that take part in this extremism and violence, to take extremism, extremist material off the internet, and do everything we can to keep our people safe. There's been a clampdown of the video footage on social media, and the Metropolitan Police has warned that viewing it could be a criminal offence. The Home Secretary, Theresa May, is also looking at ways to ban extremist organisations and tackle those who seek to radicalise others. In another recent video released by Islamic State, young British Muslims were shown urging others to fight. The Muslim Council of Britain now wants communities across the UK to stop young men being seduced by such propaganda. This subculture that's been developing of this jihadi cool, where they are uh, being lured into, into committing this criminal acts, um, uh, feeling that this is something that uh, they will be fulfilling the religious obligation or something that they feel is part of the teaching. Uh, this is totally alien to the teaching of Islam. After Lee Rigby's murder last year, a task force was set up to look at the government's strategy for dealing with extremism. Now questions are being asked about whether anything was really done to tackle it. And there are calls for more than just tougher laws. One of the things that we do need to start addressing, uh, in addition to the legal aspects, is about having the conversations within the UK as well. Why is it that young people feel um, attracted to the language of IS, for example, so of the Islamic State? While the debate continues here, there's a worldwide hunt to identify the man behind the mask, a terrorist apparently homegrown in Britain. So, how to stop British Muslims joining the fighting in Iraq and Syria. We're joined now by the writer and commentator Douglas Murray, who is the Associate Director of the Henry Jackson Society. Miriam Francois Serra is a journalist and a researcher of Islamic political movements. And Shiraz Maher is a Senior Research Fellow at the International Centre for the Study of Radicalisation. Welcome to the programme. Actually, starting with you, because you've, you've studied this, how far is this message of, of fighting for a, a caliphate, an Islamic state, spreading within British Muslim youth? I think the message is quite well established, actually, in large parts of uh, the country, particularly amongst the, the young people. That's a message that we've heard for, for about two decades, that there needs to be a caliphate and that this caliphate should be very austere, very narrow, um, very fundamentalist. And unfortunately, there are young people today who are seeing an opportunity to establish that caliphate, to realise that vision in parts of Syria and Iraq who are now motivated mm. to go out there and to try and be part of this. And I think in, th in this context, it's very, very important to say, if we look at people who went out to Syria uh, maybe 18 months ago, when we spoke to them, our centre contacts them, we try and understand their motivations for doing so. Their primary thing they were saying to us was that they were going to help the people, that they were worried about women and children, that they were worried about the oppression of civilians. When we talk to them now, either those same people or people who are going out much more recently, that narrative has completely been lost. They're saying we're here to establish an Islamic state. We don't care what the local people say. The land doesn't belong to them, it belongs to God. So you're seeing a much more uh, hard line, mm. much more callous attitude emerge. Oh, so why that change, Douglas? Well, part of it has, has got to do with the type of people going out there and the type of people attracted to it. There is a, always a certain type of person, the ideologi ideological component aside, there's always a certain type of person who relishes sadism and, and brutal violence. And, um, but this so message particularly seems to be getting hold, or as you're saying, they've been supporting a caliphate for a very long time, yeah. but, but this, is, this is different. Well, Why? yes. I mean, I mean, in the 1990s, for instance, when there was a lot of talk about you know this among some extreme fringe groups in the UK, like Hizbut Tahrir, yeah. it seemed like an impossible achievement. I mean, they always said that they wanted to make a worldwide Islamic state, but 
the striking thing in recent months is that the announcement that the Islamic State, the Caliphate, has been put together has actually made that what we all thought was a complete fantasy into a kind of reality which they can join. Mm. And uh, I just want to read you something that Lord Carey, the former Archbishop mm. of Canterbury, said in the Mail on Sunday this morning. The fact is that for too long the doctrine of multiculturalism has led to immigrants establishing completely separate communities in our cities. And he believes that is a situation that obviously mainstream Muslims find abhorrent, but has led to the development of extremism among, amongst uh, Muslim youth. Is that you something know, you would agree with? The problem is, when we talk about Islam, for example, which Islam... There are so many versions of Islam, and indeed, originally, as Miriam will know, because she's a researcher in this subject, originally, there was, the Quran was not suddenly delivered by the angel Gabriel. It evolved over the years, and in fact, uh, the first great schism in Islam, which is between Sunni and Shia, occurred shortly after uh, the Prophet's death. Now, this is because they all had different versions of Islam. So this lot, the ISIS, or whatever they're calling themselves now, IS, they regard all Shias as infidels, and therefore they must be killed. Uh, they don't even consider that they might be Muslims because they regard them as infidels. And why is that message, though, being picked it up? It is in because, Britain? well, first of all, uh, one of the reasons ISIS has had such a, a success, quote-unquote, in uh, Syria and Iraq is because they've done it very fast. They haven't waited for, as they say, words or anything like that. This means to young chaps who have been brought up by strict and decent families here, they feel people are always talking. They're not doing. And of course, the reason that the um, Islamic Empire spread so fast after, uh, finally after Muhammad's death, was because they believed it was a message from God that they were doing right. Right, and Douglas' and point this is, is what that these young boys really, because uh, they're very retarded. In they're, some they're, ways. Follow, they're following this message, Miriam, because now they can see that there is an Islamic state which is which is gaining hold. Do you think that's the reason? for some turning to the message? I think, I think IS, first of all, I don't think we should do it um, the uh, favour of calling it an Islamic state. I think that plays into very much the image that no, they No, they like call themselves Islamic state, exactly. but they don't have one yet. No, and I would say that, you know, um, I, I'll refer to them as IS. But, mm. I mean, IS is a product of a political reality, not an ancient religion. And it's quite clear that when you look at the profile many of the young men who head out there, they are what one report refers to as religious novices. Uh, yeah. If you look at the uh, two books that were ordered by the two Brummies recently who were convicted, yes. um, they were Islam for dummies and the Quran for dummies. Quite clearly, these young men are not uh, religiously literate. So, so why are they doing it then? Well, first of all, I think Shiraz pointed out quite rightly that the uh, sh Syrian conflict cannot be underestimated in terms of the motivation here. There are a lot of young people who feel extremely frustrated by the Syrian conflict, by the hundreds and thousands of people who are being killed there, and the impotence that many people feel. If you combine that with a situation in which a number of young people in this country feel politically disenfranchised, marginalised, let's look at the profile of some of these young men. They're coming from uh, Portsmouth, they're coming from Cardiff, they're coming from Aberdeen. They're not investment bankers from Chelsea, let's face it. These are guys who are either unemployed or working in But Primark. you're saying that poverty is drawing to them to this message. I think poverty and alienation right. absolutely well, provide it's... the structural factors which okay. draw people to messages, radical Miriam, messages. I'd just like to say, I actually agree with you on m m most things. As Fantastic. You know. Yes, <laughs> most things, not everything. But it is to do with Islam in a mm. sense because Islam was founded by the sword, let's face it. It really was. Mm. It's, and not it, to, it's not to do with Islam. It's well, not, it's no, right. what I'm, I'm saying sorry. is no, it's let, attracting. No, no, come on. Robert, people who let's, want let's have, have a bit of and doing no, something. Let's have a bit of clarity. This is not a British problem. No. And it's not an Islamic problem either. The fact is, if you look at the history of terrorism, it occurs particularly amongst young people, mm -hmm. Bader Meinhof, the Red Army yeah, faction, absolutely. 1970, 1990, the, the, the things that happened in Cambodia, the things that have happened in China, the things that have happened mm. in Kashmir again and again, and in Africa at the moment, mm. young boy soldiers. So one of, one of the issues is that this is the recruitment of youth mm. at a time when they're, they're probably their most disaffected most right. easy to recruit. Yeah. And, so, and so actually Miriam's got a really good point here, which we, it's a question of how you 
alter that in your society. Mm, in absolutely. this case, we're facing wait, wait, a particular wait. problem in our society, but it's certainly not a British problem. In a moment, problem. Douglas, I do, because, because I want to bring in somebody who is a, a young Muslim man who does support the idea of a caliphate created by Islamic State. His name's Abu Ramasai, and uh, he joins us from our London newsroom. Why do you support IS? Well, I don't think it's a question of myself just supporting the Islamic State or the Caliphate or Khalifa Ibrahim Hafidahullah. What I can say is that Muslims, they cherish the Quran and the Sunnah. And for over 90 years, we have been living without a Caliphate. And many of the rules within the Quran can't be implemented. So now that we have this Caliphate, I think you'll see many Muslims globally seeing it, seeing it as an opportunity for the, for the Quran to be fully realized and for justice to, justice to prevail everywhere. Is it, do you, do you uh, allow the Quran to be fully realized by murdering those who won't convert, by beheading journalists? Well, I'd say in reply to that, that there are a lot of lies being pushed out by the BBC and, and generally oh. the media. <laughs> so, so you believe it, it, it's a lie that, that, that Christians and Yazidis have been murdered by Islamic State fighters? Well, I think it's been largely exaggerated, and I think that's been disclosed <laughs> by, the, by the general media. I would say that it's the policy of the Islamic State to cater for and to protect non-Muslim citizens. It's not in their interest to massacre non-Muslims. But yes, they're doing we, it, though, aren't they? You, you yes, agree are, that they're doing it? I agree, it. yes, we are seeing a conflict. We are seeing people die. We are in the middle of a global war. And we are seeing people who are fighting the Islamic State, whether they're Shia, whether they're Sunni, or you know, whether they are Christian or, or whatever other denomination. But I think it's very um, absurd to say that, on one hand, that it's, it's not allowed for people to defend themselves against brutal airstrikes being launched by America and being so supported by the British. I mean, why are we not saying that British soldiers are being radicalised to go over to Iraq and Syria and to kill Muslims? Abu, why, are they, why are they not disenfranchised? Could I ask, were you born here? You grew up here? Yes, Went I was to born school here, here with, 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 Christi with people of all denominations. Mm -hmm. Then why do you hate them so much? Well, as, as a Muslim, I would like to see Britain governed by the Sharia. That's not because oh. I want to oppress non-Muslims, but I believe it's far superior to, to democracy. But as and we I don't have the Sharia law, is better. we don't have Sharia law in this country. Uh, do you still consider yourself British? Well, I call myself Muslim, and um, I don't really identify myself with British values. I'm Muslim first, second and last. And I hope one day, and I invite all non-Muslims listening to this message to embrace Islam and follow the final messenger, Muhammad. And I would as well say, don't believe many of the lies that are being pushed out about the Caliphate, about Khalifa Ibrahim, because many of them are not true. I mean, we're getting a lot of conflicting reports the other okay. month. The other all month. right. Abu, I'm going to bring Shiraz here. In. I mean, how, how would you respond to that sort of message? from Abu, and, and how many people does he speak for when he speaks like that? Well, he represents an incredibly tiny minority of people. The difference between him and the sorts of fighters we see going out is that they're not content with sitting around in TV studios espousing these opinions. They've actually got up and gone. In many cases, we've seen women get up and go as well. So he's just really someone who's had a very long history of kind of radical activism and spouting these kinds of very inflammatory opinions, but doesn't actually walk the walk when it, when it comes down to it. The people who are far more dangerous are the people who actually associate with men like him, who are on the peripheries of the networks that men like and him are activated. So, and, and much younger in some Younger cases. and irresponsible. Yes. Right. Yes, because there's so much testosterone in their blood there. And unfortunately, in traditional Islam fa Islamic families, you know, moderate, nice people, they don't give an enormous amount of outlet. For example, they're not supposed to have sex before marriage. Well, it's quite difficult to get married to a divine, you know, divinely touched Muslim woman who is still a virgin and all of that. So it... Promise well, of 72 well, virgins okay. in Paris, well, but what we're which does what, not exist what we're in trying the Quran. To, what we're trying to get to, though, is, is some understanding of why some British young Muslims are, are listening to the IS voice and want to go over and, and fight there, and mm. what can be done to stop it. Could I just Douglas? quickly, I mean, of course this is a young men issue. Yes. I mean, um, I think Dag's chronicled every single person in the US and UK who's been convicted of terrorism-related mm. offences in this regard in the last 15 years. Mm. The overwhelming majority are young men. Of mm. course we're dealing with young men. But you can't then ignore the fact that for them, whether you like it or not, whether we like it or not, for them, an interpretation of Islam mm. is the reason that they are doing this. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, for us, this is the most appalling interpretation of Islam. For Muslims, it's the worst possible interpretation of Islam. But it is an interpretation, and that's why, you know, it, it, although it's more convenient for us to pretend that this has nothing to do with Islam, we do have to accept that it does in order for Muslims and others to fight against the interpretation that people like those in I ISIS, yes. and indeed okay. your, uh, your, I, I your loony you're guest here, really. have, you know, have, I don't have think anyone's said. denying, Douglas, that there's a, a misinterpretation of Islam that, that well, people like... Well, an interpretation, like... well, it's a misinterpretation. 
interpretation fine, or not. It's fine. Interpretation. And, and interpretation by a fringe group is being spread. Absolutely, no doubt, and I don't think anyone's denying that. I think the, the critical well, issue is... Hang on, let Miriam no, finish her I'm, point. I think, broadly speaking, there is a, an acceptance that an interpretation of Islam is being used to justify a certain politi politicised message. But I think the key issue here is whether or not that sort of cultural explanation is the predominant explanation. And I would say, actually, what we're looking at is what are the factors which uh, encourage young men uh, to get involved in any sort of crime or criminality, be that gangs or Absolutely. jihadism. And those factors tend to be linked to alienation, to poverty. Okay. If, I could, if I could just very, very quickly, I mean, every single young person at some point in their life feels alienation, mm -hmm. no, no, uh, feels disenfranchisement. Out, most people feel we're left out at some point. Point, we're not I mean, talking most, about that. most young people at some point. The question is, what are you going to do about it? And the yeah. problem we have in this country is that there is a large echo chamber of people who want to play into that perceived set of grievances. Let me give you one very quick example. Okay, Western foreign policy. We hear yes. all the time, uh, uh, um, and your, your loony guest here just did it, um, uh, the, the fact that, that British forces have been engaged in the Middle East is a reason for radicalisation. Let me put it this way. In the 1990s, we didn't get involved in the Balkans. I have n and then we did. I have never heard one Muslim leader in this country say, how much we are grateful to NATO for intervening in the right, Balkans and saving Muslim lives. In other words, we have the West is at risk, we have the is at risk of being... intervention or okay, non-intervention the West is at risk of being be blamed risk. when we intervene and when okay. we don't. I know, and, and what problem. we're trying to get to now is, is, not, about, is not, not about intervention versus non-intervention and what, what the, the, the roots were, but what we do now to get out of where we are mm -hmm. and what is the best thing to do. I mean, Lord Kerry this morning is saying if he hears those sorts of extremist views peddled, he says take away their passports. Take away their British it's passports. It won't, young help. Men. it won't help, unfortunately. No. <coughs> George Kerry is an excellent man, but that's not going to make a fundamental difference. No, no. So what, <coughs> what, I have a great what makes the difference? I have a huge respect for your organisation, which I think does really good work. But I think it's very worrying if we classify it as, an, as, as, as a problem of Islam, because I think that what we're seeing in Britain so much is real collaboration between different religious groups. Mm. Uh, Jews and, and, and Muslims, for example, probably are closer than they've been for a very long time in Britain. And the, and the, the risk, I think, to, to, to community harmony is a very serious one. But, but, but and so that's, that's why we have to deal with some of the other problems we have in our society, which must be education, which must yes, be we, poverty, we all want to deal with education which must be democracy. Yes. All right. Yes. And we'll talk about what the government's plans are as well to do things w within law and strengthen the law here in just a second. I want to go back to Abu and ask whether you've thought, as you don't identify with Britain or British values, whether you've thought about handing in your passport. Well, I did give an interview, interview recently on Channel 4 and I, I did make the offer of perhaps renouncing citizenship and I think <laughs> if a lot of Muslims were offered that, you'd see a, a huge migration of Muslims from this country to the Caliphate. No, and as wouldn't. soon as they oh. got No, there. you wouldn't. Well, Hang on, let, let, Miriam, why, well, can, address, can address Abu that? directly. Why don't you think? Sorry, uh, well, I mean, no, you wouldn't see a mass exodus of Muslims. Well, can, I, can, I, um, can I make a comeback you, on that? You might can see, I make a comeback on that? Hang on, no, that? let Miriam make her point. I and mean, then you, you, can you, come might, back you might see one or two individuals, but I'm not even sure that this gentleman here would, would leave himself. No. Um, would you leave, Abu? Of course, I mean, if I had a safe passage to, to the you? Caliphate, I'll be the first one on the you? plane to go to the Caliphate and live there. But why don't the sad, you? The sad reality is, is that why the British don't government you? are we'll, implementing we'll do a whip around. policies go on. and they're arresting many Muslims at airports and, and preventing them from going to the Caliphate. So that's, think, that, is, that is an issue that needs to be rectified. There, there I mean, is one hang on, hang on. Hang on. That's my view. There, there is one important point here, which is the broader issue of whether taking away citizenship mm. does assist in these matters. And I think the key issue is we don't actually assist the matter by pretending it's not our problem. By taking away somebody's British, mm. British citizenship, right. what are we saying? Oh, they're not British, it's not our problem. No, we need to recognise that there are disaffected members of British society who do need to be reinserted right. into broader society. Okay, and you've made that point very clear. I, you, and poor you've white made, and boy, we, so Everybody's clearly. made that point very clearly. I think the, the point is, is what you do now to try to stop it. Now, what we've seen with Islamic State, with IS, which we didn't see in the past with Al-Qaeda, is a very effective use of social media. So the message is spreading incredibly quickly. And I want to bring in uh, Ross Frenet, who's a political analyst at the Institute for Strategic Dialogue Think Tank, who joins us from our Glasgow studio. And I know that this is something that you've been concentrated on, concentrating on. How effective is that slick propaganda message that IS are putting forward, Ross? 
Um, I mean, it can be very receptive indeed. Um, and it's not just, uh, as uh, Shiraz and others would, would also uh, be able to vouch for, it's not just IS putting out their own propaganda. It's There's a whole cohort of individuals um, online who are acting as cheerleaders, as intermediaries, and are creating content um, which is... Uh, steering people towards supporting these kinds of actions. Um, at the opening segment, we, we heard David Cameron talk about the issues here, and we heard him talk about taking extremist material off the internet. Um, we haven't heard nearly enough about putting more positive material onto the internet, um, creating counter narratives mm -hmm. uh, to undermine the religious justification, creating counter narratives to point out the reality of what uh, the Islamic State are doing on the ground, and even to point out the reality of uh, what life would be like for mm -hmm. uh, these young men that go over there. I if mean, they do go over there, actually, you're getting a lot of nods of agreement, That's including with Douglas the case. here. It, 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 it comes back to the point I just made about interventionism and about this country's foreign policy. There is such a wellspring of lies out there, mm -hmm. which in the mainstream media and all sorts of places about what this country and our allies do, a very, very large wellspring of lies. It is very easy for young people of any political yeah. or religious background to seize on that and feel some kind of added resentment because of it. So we have to make sure that the narratives of what this country actually does, what this country actually is, are much better got out there. Okay, yeah. Shiraz, is it also about Muslims in various communities having a louder voice and saying, not in our name, Effectively. I mean, I think we have seen that to an extent. Mm -hmm. If you look back over the last yes. 10 years, there's been a real emergence of grassroots civic Muslim organizations mm -hmm. who are better placed now yeah. in order to, to fight this um, campaign. Mm -hmm. The issue is, I think Douglas touches upon it uh, quite well, is the way the arguments went before, it was all focused around the idea of foreign policy and that there could be a foreign policy solution to radicalization. I think the Syrian conflict makes it clear that there's not mm -hmm. um, a, a solution that comes from a foreign policy basis. Of course the war in Iraq inflamed lots of people, it angered lots of people, and so we were, said, it was, we were told that foreign policy can provoke people into uh, engaging in sort of terrorist activity. But now we have what you could call the um, radicalization by omission. We're being mm. told because we didn't intervene in Syria, yeah. people are being radicalized and yeah. have to go there. So I think Muslim community groups are now on the ground trying to have this debate, but the debate has changed. It was a civilizational debate before, okay. the West versus Islam. Now it's an internal debate, Sunni Shias. Mm -hmm. And that's a very difficult debate to have for yeah. government. It's got to come from within the community. Mm. Well, we're going to go to Greenbelt. It's a Christian festival, but it's uh, attended by other faiths as well. And uh, join Nell, who has some guests with her. Nell, what are they saying there? Some really interesting points raised there. Uh, we're going to talk about them now with the Professor of Sociology of Religion, Professor Linda Woodhead at Lancaster University. Is this a preventable issue and how can we prevent homegrown extremism? Well, it is about young people, it is about religion, and their government has been trying for many years now. There have been many solutions, hard and soft. You need a mixture of things. But I think a key point that is missed is a really systematic solution. And if you're talking about young people and religion, that has to involve schools. What's happened to RE, to religious education in schools at the moment, is a disaster. It's not taken seriously. It's pushed out of the curriculum. If you equip people with true understanding of what Islam is and the tools to interpret it, you can inoculate them against a lot of the misinformation that lies behind some of this. Uh, we're now joined by Abdul Rahman Malik. You're, you are a journalist as well as uh, working with the Radical Middle Way. Are we failing to get to grips with this issue? You know, I, I, when I look back on my life, I've been engaged in this stuff since the early 1990s when it wasn't popular and when some of the panelists sitting in your studio, it wasn't even on their radar. So I would say that communities have done a heck of a lot. There's a lot of resilience in, in our communities. I think the path forward is about strengthening civil society, strengthening the men and women and young people up and down this country who do incredible work in our communities, who give to Britain as British uh, citizens, who engage every day, is to strengthen them, strengthen uh, their voice, and strengthen their capacity to do good and to continue to work with our neighbors, our friends, our, our friends and uh, those who are in our communities to do the positive stuff. That's resilience and that's what we need more of. Abdul, thank you so much. Food for thought there, Sean. Yes, I think it's interesting, thank you now, uh, that the guests talking about strength and the voices of the positive and that celebration of religion, you can hear it with all the music. And it is about, isn't it, Douglas, getting that 
more positive message through and trying to quieten the negative well, stuff. But, well, but how yeah, do but you what, do that? what we tend to do, unfortunately, is, mm. I mean, Law Winston just did it earlier on, is, is the thing mm. because it's so uncomfortable, we don't want to have the discussion. Mm. Our societies are no longer very good at discussing religion, and here comes mm. along a religion most people are unused to in this country, and we don't know how to discuss it, we'd rather not. Mm. The fact is, there are some very uncomfortable things which Muslims globally have to deal with mm. and have to globally ha have that internal discussion about. And we do not, I think, help them that process. If we say it has nothing to do with the Quran, nothing to do with Muhammad, nothing to do with Islam, it does it a does. little bit, and or, or a major bit in some people's beliefs, it has something to do with that, and it's very important not to ignore that, because only by dealing with that can you actually take on the extremists. Mm. Otherwise, a young man like your, your lunatic guest earlier is very likely to have been told by people, there's nothing in the Quran to, to justify this violence. He finds a verse given oh. to him by an extremist that shows the, the, the yes. behead the you yes. know the, the unbeliever right. and then he thinks all these other people are lying yes. to me we have to take on things to stop that okay happening. so we have to hear the voices however uncomfortable they are and then challenge them um, well I think stop in, in, in a free society I should hope that there is room to hear unpalatable views but in the case of um, engaging communities there has to be a, a balance that's taken between uh, specifically placing and I think this is perhaps why I would disagree with Douglas uh, too much onus on the uh, community which you know is disparate there is no single person at the head of it who can tell everyone else how they should or shouldn't mm -hmm. behave and therefore that's some sort of collective blame being placed mm -hmm. on them but at the same time as um, the uh, guests we saw the, uh, the from the radical middle way pointed out communities need to be part of the solution and to do that they need to have trust in the police and there needs to be a much greater cooperation between the community secret services and the police and at the moment there's a a lot of distrust okay. there. That's where the efforts really need to be focused. All right, okay. Thank you very much, all of you, uh, for that discussion. More on that shortly back at the Greenbelt Festival, too. First, though, to the story that's dominated the week. Why do some young British Muslims start to hate the country they live in? And what will stop them joining fanatics and turning to violence? When the American journalist James Foley was beheaded by Islamic State militants, the video of his death showed a masked man who appeared to have a London accent. While the authorities try to trace him, the government is also talking of tougher measures to crack down on anyone who might be peddling so-called hate speech. But how big is that threat and what can be done to try to stop it? James Foley's death shocked the world, not only with its barbarity, but also because his killer is thought to be British. The news prompted the Prime Minister to return early from his holiday. What we must do is redouble all our efforts to stop people going, to take away the passports of those contemplating travel, to arrest and prosecute those that take part in this extremism and violence, to take extremism, extremist material off the internet, and do everything we can to keep our people safe. There's been a clampdown of the video footage on social media and the Metropolitan Police has warned that viewing it could be a criminal offence. The Home Secretary, Theresa May, is also looking at ways to ban extremist organisations and tackle those who seek to radicalise others. In another recent video released by Islamic State, young British Muslims were shown urging others to fight. The Muslim Council of Britain now wants communities across the UK to stop young men being seduced by such propaganda. This subculture that's been developing of this jihadi cool, where they're uh, being lured into, into committing this criminal acts, um, uh, feeling that this is something that uh, they will be fulfilling the religious obligation or something that they feel is part of the teaching. Uh, this is totally alien to the teaching of Islam. After Lee Rigby's murder last year, a task force was set up to look at the government's strategy for dealing with extremism. Now questions are being asked about whether anything was really done to tackle it. And there are calls for more than just tougher laws. One of the things that we do need to start addressing, uh, in addition to the legal aspects, is about having the conversations within the UK as well. Why is it that young people feel um, attracted to the language of IS, for example, so of the Islamic State? While the debate continues here, there's a worldwide hunt to identify the man behind the mask, a terrorist apparently homegrown in Britain.
So, how to stop British Muslims joining the fighting in Iraq and Syria. We're joined now by the writer and commentator Douglas Murray, who is the Associate Director of the Henry Jackson Society. Miriam Francis Serra is a journalist and a researcher of Islamic political movements. And Shiraz Maher is a Senior Research Fellow at the International Centre for the Study of Radicalisation. Welcome to the programme. Actually, starting with you, because you, you've studied this, how far is this message of, of fighting for a, a caliphate, an Islamic state, spreading within British Muslim youth? I think the message is quite well established, actually, in large parts of uh, the country, particularly amongst the, the young people. That's a message that we've heard for, for about two decades, that there needs to be a caliphate and that this caliphate should be very austere, very narrow, um, very fundamentalist. And unfortunately, there are young people today who are seeing an opportunity to establish that caliphate, to realize that vision in parts of Syria and Iraq who are now motivated mm. to go out there and to try and be part of this. And I think in, th in this context, it's very, very important to say, if we look at people who went out to Syria uh, maybe 18 months ago, when we spoke to them, our center contacts them, we try and understand their motivations for doing so. Their primary thing they were saying to us was that they were going to help the people, that they were worried about women and children, that they were worried about the oppression of civilians. When we talk to them now, either those same people or people who are going out much more recently, that narrative has completely been lost. They're saying we're here to establish an Islamic state. We don't care what the local people say. The land doesn't belong to them, it belongs to God. So you're seeing a much more uh, hard line, mm. much more callous attitude emerge. Oh, so why that change, Douglas? Well, part of it has, has got to do with the type of people going out there and the type of people attracted to it. There is a, always a certain type of person, the ideologi ideological component aside, there's always a certain type of person who relishes sadism and, and brutal violence. And, um, but this so message particularly seems to be getting hold, or as you're saying, they've been supporting a caliphate for a very long time, yeah. but, but this, is, this is different. Well, Why? yes. I mean, I mean, in the 1990s, for instance, when there was a lot of talk about you know, this among some extreme fringe groups in the UK, like Hizbut Tahrir, yeah. it seemed like an impossible achievement. I mean, they always said that they wanted to make a worldwide Islamic state. But the striking thing in recent months is that the announcement that the Islamic state, the caliphate, has been put together has actually made that what we all thought was a complete fantasy into a kind of reality which they can join. Mm. Mm. And uh, I just want to read you something that Lord Carey, the former Archbishop mm. of Canterbury, said in the Mail on Sunday this morning. The fact is that for too long the doctrine of multiculturalism has led to immigrants establishing completely separate communities in our cities. And he believes that is a situation that obviously mainstream Muslims find abhorrent, but has led to the mm. development of extremism amongst uh, Muslim youth. Is that you something know, you would agree the, with? The problem is, when we talk about Islam, for example, which Islam... There are so many versions of Islam, and indeed, originally, as Miriam will know, because she's a researcher in this subject, originally, there was, the Quran was not suddenly delivered by the angel Gabriel. It evolved over the years, and in fact, uh, the first great schism in Islam, which is between Sunni and Shia, occurred shortly after uh, the Prophet's death. Now, this is because they all had different versions of Islam. So this lot, the ISIS, or whatever they're calling themselves now, IS, they regard all Shias as infidels, and therefore they must be killed. Uh, they don't even consider that they might be Muslims because they regard them as infidels. And why is that message, though, being picked it up? It is in because, Britain? well, first of all, uh, one of the reasons ISIS has had such a, a success, quote-unquote, in uh, Syria and Iraq is because they've done it very fast. They haven't waited for, as they say, words or anything like that. This means to young chaps who have been brought up by strict and decent families here, they feel people are always talking. They're not doing. And of course, the reason that the um, Islamic Empire spread so fast after, uh, finally after Muhammad's death, was because they believed it was a message from God that they were doing right. Right, and Douglas' and point this is, is what these young boys really, because uh, they're very retarded. In they're, some they're, ways. Follow, they're following this message, Miriam, because now they can see that there is an Islamic state which is which is gaining hold. Do you think that's the reason? 
for some turning to the message? I think, I think IS, first of all, I don't think we should do it um, the uh, favour of calling it an Islamic state. I think that plays into very much the image that no, they No, they like call themselves portray. Islamic state, exactly. but they don't have one yet. No, and I would say that, you know, um, I, I'll refer to them as IS. But, mm. I mean, IS is a product of a political reality, not an ancient religion. And it's quite clear that when you look at the profile and many of the young men who head out there, they are what one report refers to as religious novices. Uh, yeah. If you look at the uh, two books that were ordered by the two Brummies recently who were convicted, yes. um, they were Islam for dummies and the Quran for dummies. Quite clearly, these young men are not uh, religiously literate. So why are they being... doing it then? Well, first of all, I think Shiraz pointed out quite rightly that the uh, sh Syrian conflict cannot be underestimated in terms of the motivation here. There are a lot of young people who feel extremely frustrated by the Syrian conflict, by the hundreds and thousands of people who are being killed there, and the impotence that many people feel. If you combine that with a situation in which a number of young people in this country feel politically disenfranchised, marginalised, let's look at the profile of some of these young men. They're coming from uh, Portsmouth, they're coming from Cardiff, they're coming from Aberdeen. They're not investment bankers from Chelsea, let's face it. These are guys who are either unemployed or working in But Primark. you're saying that poverty is drawing to them to this message? I think poverty and alienation right. absolutely well, provide the structural factors which okay. draw people to messages, radical Miriam, messages. I'd just like to say, I actually agree with you on m m most things. As Fantastic. You know. Yes, most <laughs> things, not everything. But it is to do with Islam in a mm. sense because Islam was founded by the sword, let's face it. It really was. Mm. It's, and not it, to, it's not to do with Islam. It's well, not, it's no, right. what I'm, I'm saying sorry. is no, it's let's, attracting let's, no, no, come on, people let's, who let's, want let's excitement have, have and doing no, something. Let's have a bit of clarity. This is not a British problem, no. and it's not an Islamic problem either. The fact is, if you look at the history of terrorism, it occurs particularly amongst young people, mm -hmm. Bader Meinhof, the Red Army yeah, faction, absolutely. 1970, 1990, the, the, the things that happened in Cambodia, the things that have happened in China, the things that have happened mm. in Kashmir again and again, young, and in Africa at the moment, mm. young boy soldiers. So one of, one of the issues is that this is the recruitment of youth yes. at a time when they're, they're probably their most disaffected, most right. easy to recruit. I, yeah. and, so, and so actually Miriam's got a really good point here, which we, it's a question of how...